Yeah, so in this talk, uh, I'm going to focus more a little bit on the operational side, uh, using, of course, AI, because there's no talk today uh, without the AI buzzword, right? And so what I called uh, this talk is a little bit the journey towards what I call the network nirvana, right? And I stole the slide of TM Forum, which actually I ended, or I talked about last year, for those who are in the room, right? And so TM Forum basically built this uh, level zero. Actually, it's built by machines because they start from zero, right, to level five. And I think what you see, I mean, if you look to, to, to what they try to do is they basically say, okay, if you look today to how we do network operations, right, you have basically on the left-hand side people that operate by humans, right? And then on the right-hand side, it is a very machine, actually, it's completely machine operated, right? And on one hand, it would be nice because everybody here that is in the conference doesn't want to be called by some of the ops guys to say that the network is down and they have to help troubleshoot. So it's good to have the machines actually help and assist you to accommodate for that, right? Now, it's always interesting uh, and too good to see. Is there anyone here who believes that they are a level four or level five type of operations? No hands, okay, that's what I was expecting, right? Because I w one of the things I'm very uh, involved in automation, right? And uh, so there is a dedicated conference called Network Automation Forum, by the way, who is actually having the question, why is network automation not being adopted, right? So basically what it shows to me is that we are basically in the level zero to level one for the most part, right? And it's actually interesting to, to see what uh, that journey is, right? So and as such, we always have to ask the question, what does an autonomous network operation mean, right? So, and I try to depict here onto the slides a number of topics that, and maybe it's not complete, but it's pretty exhaustive, right? If you look to operation, there's a bunch of activities that we uh, have around us. And I think for all of us, what's, what I would like to accomplish in this talk is actually think about some of these things. And if we see or Think of where you can improve or use efficiencies to that, that today are happening by humans, right? And how you can use more machines to actually be involved. I think we make progress, right? Because I believe that this is a journey, right? And so this is not something that is going to happen overnight, right? So we all have to learn from each other and we actually have to help. So, and I think all the progresses that we make would actually help us to accommodate, right? And I have a slide in a bit. Uh, which is interesting because you will see that some of these journeys that we have gone through took almost like half, more than half of a century, right? So I would hate that we sit here 50 years from now <laughs> and we still are at this level. So uh, the goal of my talk is basically to inspire you and to promote everyone who actually make progress in this journey towards operating in a more autonomous fashion, the networks that we, that we operate mainly manually today. Now, it's always good to look back into other industry. And I didn't took the car because that was already talked about. So I took the flight and the planes, right? Because it's uh, probably all of us here have been experiencing that. And it's always good to, and interesting to see what people or what other people and other industries do, right? And so first of all, if you look to the plane industry, so the first thing they did is they did a lot. So they instrumented the plane like crazy, right? So anything that can go wrong, they basically get a single. Right? So in other words, you get information uh, that something goes wrong, and then they have a bunch of checklists uh, that actually try to measure how they uh, basically do according to that checklist. And basically, when you, when you take a plane, so typically you get thumbs up or thumbs down. Right? So we all know that from the AI side, all good or all bad. So you see that some of these things that we are experiencing today are actually uh, happening and are actually learned from, from other industry. But Interestingly enough is that you see that uh, although some of these operations are still involving humans, right? But for the most part, when the plane takes off, it actually flies autonomously. And it's done in a very highly redundant fashion. So you have, first of all, two pilots, right? For redundancy, but all the engines and stuff like that. So that's highly redundant. So uh, because we play with people's lives and we don't want to be in the news when something goes wrong, right? So think about those type of things or those type of operations or to those type of industries that actually are looking at automation uh, day in, day out, right? Now, I always try to reflect back of how we got here, right? And it's interesting to see, if you look back, the ARPANET, we started with four sites. 
And so this is a slide on the century. So if you look at the dates, 1969, <laughs> we started this journey till today. So it's more than half a century. But it's amazing what we achieved, right? And you can say the internet is actually running autonomously, right? But it's highly operated by humans if something goes wrong or something happens. So there's a lot of human effort involved to keep this going, right? But interestingly enough, if you look to when we started with four sites and we look today, can anyone say how many sites we have right now? Probably not, right? Because we have built a very highly distributed system that runs in an autonomous system. And so we started off with static routes and we involved like routing protocols, IGP. So Kiriti talked about Dijkstra and some of the evolution, right? So we built actually a very distributed system that actually runs autonomously, loop-free, with traffic engineering and all that stuff, right? So pretty amazing, right? But still, we operate in a very human-centric fashion, right? Now, if you look to the different components, and so I started, actually, I should have called this a network operating system instead of a router, right? Because I started to look at what did we do so far and what do we need in this agentic operation to come to that autonomous system. So that is basically the talk. So if you look to how a network operating system is built, it starts at the bottom. We have like this abstraction layer, right? Because today you want to have a NOS that supports multiple hardware environments. So what we call, I, so I, I call this the SI layer, right? So system abstraction interface, because your network operating system wants to support multiple chip or chip generations that are out there to power uh, the networks, right? And then a modern network operating system, what does it have? It has a, these days a pops up type of interface. You talk to a database, you get an event, and all your software basically acts in a dynamic fashion to events, right? And then we have two types of applications that we actually run onto the network operating system. One is what I call the trusted ones. So we give them the keys to the kingdom. So those are routing protocols. And the second that we have is untrustable, which are typically the humans or the things through the APIs, right? And what did we do? We built in a candidate data store to actually say, okay, I want this change. And then we built in change control to actually say, okay, I want this change to happen. And we implement that in a, what I call a transaction way, similar to how the financial industry does transactions when you pay a certain thing and you want to ensure that that transaction succeeded, right? So in other words, we build in guardrails for the untrustable environment and we built in or we gave certain applications the keys to the kingdom because they run in an autonomous fashion, right? Now, if you look to the picture and if you then say, okay, how would the next layer look like? Right, because we don't operate device per device, so typical people have tens, hundreds, thousands, multiple thousand routers that they operate on a day-by-day -day basis. How would that look like? And it's actually interesting because if you look to this picture, you actually see a lot of similarities. Right? And so it's funny because when I, I did this presentation, actually I started building this picture and then I basically did a reflection to say actually a router is built in the same way. So let me explain what is here. So relate the SI to the same layer as the provider, right? So what is the provider? We talk in the network to multiple routers, multiple NOSs. Some people want one NOS, but that's not the reality, right? So, so we have a provider layer that built that abstraction, right? That then interacts with multiple vendors, multiple NOSs, multiple generations, right? The second thing that we did is we built this a uh, pop-up layer, which is a set of database or data stores, as we call it, right? And we have the actual, which is the same as the state. We have running config, which is the same as the main. And we have a candidate, which is the same as your branch, if we call it, right? So in other words, there's a lot of similarities here, right? And then we built agents that sits on top of that. Now, I'll explain what the agents are, but in a nutshell, we have two types of agents. We have things that we trust and things that we don't trust. So for example, a PCE or your SDN control is some of these agents that we trust and we give them what I call the keys to the kingdom so they basically can change the topology, they can change in an intent-based fashion 
the, the, the forwarding behavior of our network, right? And that is others that we don't trust, right? And so you see the same uh, flexibility that, that was done on the route, right? And then the interesting side is that if we don't trust, we typically go to a change control. And for people who have heard about that, and people will talk about it, we go to a digital twin where we can test, simulate, before we actually apply the change into the network, right? And then there is another new component that comes into picture, which is what I call the knowledge base, right? And that is the important element, because with this architecture today, you can basically go to a chatbot and ask, how is my network doing? So with this framework, you will be able to achieve that right now, right? But if you look at an autonomous operation, what we really want to do is actually make decisions, right? And that's where the agent comes into play, right? And if you look at the agents, I, what, what are they about, right? Because I think we all talk about it, but the question is, what do they do? And so, in a summary, I try to depict it in this slide. And the way I, I describe them is, it's an entity that sends reasons and acts, right? And I think it's good to reflect what you do as a human. If you get a task, what do you do? Your manager or someone gives you that job, right? And the first thing we do is we basically say, we look at the context, right? We say, okay, what is going on? Give me some information. And then we reason based on the knowledge that we have, right? And then we take a decision, and then depending whether you're trustable or not, you get to do the action in a, in a reasonable fashion, right? So if you look to those components, you see that with that framework, you can actually get to that what I call the autonomous network operation, right? Now, <coughs> I didn't talk about intents so far, right? But intent-based networking is actually an important aspect. And, I, and as you know, I've been doing some um, development on this. Because today, with AI systems, you can actually give uh, a specification, let's say, the API spec of your intents, and you can actually ask it to generate. So and it's pretty accurate in actually doing that if you give the right knowledge, right? So as such, if you can describe what your network is about, it is very easy to actually have the AI or the knowledge system or the agentic system actually reason about what you want to accomplish and how to do that, right? And I think this is the crux of how to make this work. The third thing that I wanted to highlight is that agent is not one agent. It is a set of agents. And I think the other key element to the framework that we have to build is making those agents work in harmony and work in collaboration, right? And so you have things like MCP, so like Model Context Protocol, which are actually helping agents to communicate and together come to a certain outcome that we have defined for them to be achieved, right? And I think so what I wanted to depict in this talk is that framework. And so you can, if you look back to my initial slide on all the operational tasks, there is a bunch of them that you can do with this framework, right? And with that, that's my last slide. So if you're ready to take off the plane, I'm happy to chat with you and uh, enjoy lunch. Thank you. <laughs>